of difficult access and where sheer speed is required, teams may be deployed using fast roping techniques. In hostage rescue scenarios, every second counts, and the quickest way of getting a team off a helicopter is by using fast ropes, which can deploy a team of 40 soldiers in a matter of seconds. There are no hooks or fastenings. Gravity and a good grip is all the ingredients needed to get down. In any scenario, the squadron will plan to attack the building in a number of ways. Multiple teams will aim to assault the building from all directions. Sometimes aerial deployment is just not practical. And where a large area of open ground needs to be covered quickly, the SAS may employ certain methods that may appear somewhat unorthodox. The risks involved in performing a hostage rescue are immense and represent one of the most dangerous aspects of the SAS's duties, particularly when hostages and terrorists are in close proximity or in the same room as one another. This is when the team will rely heavily on their CQB skills. CQB or close quarter battle is a form of fighting developed by the SAS and covers a wide range of pistol and submachine gun techniques, room entry procedures and fast but deadly unarmed combat maneuvers. All are essential skills that need to become second nature when it comes to counter-terrorist scenarios. These unique abilities are perfected in a building at SAS headquarters affectionately known as the Killing House. This purpose-built facility is designed with the express intent of recreating all kinds of hostage scenarios, giving soldiers the opportunity to learn, practice and hone their shooting skills. When on hostage rescue duties, the team will spend many, many hours in the killing house, expending thousands of rounds of ammunition. Realism is essential and therefore only live bullets are used. When first joining the SAS, most soldiers arrive with no prior experience of firing either a pistol or a submachine gun. Training starts with the basics. The first thing a soldier must learn is how to draw, hold and fire his pistol quickly and accurately. Reaction times are everything in a lethal confrontation and a team member must be able to draw their gun in a split second to give them the advantage. During CQB, terrorists will be pumped up on adrenaline. They might even be high on drugs. Sometimes one shot just isn't enough. And when he's got his finger on a trigger, you need to make sure he goes down. For that reason, SAS soldiers must learn to perfect the double tap. If you fire one shot, you may not bring that guy down. If you fire two shots in quick succession, within a couple of inches of each other, it's like getting hit with a sledgehammer twice, and that will put him down. The pistol is mostly used as a backup weapon. The main weapon of choice for all SAS counter-terrorists is the MP5. The MP5 is well recognized as one of the most accurate and reliable submachine guns in the world. Learning how to fire it accurately needs to become second nature. A team member will spend hundreds of hours becoming more and more confident with their weapon, to a point where it becomes an extension of their hand. We normally use it on single shot and fire double taps, obviously for control. You don't want to get into a building if you're on fully automatic and start spraying bullets all around the place because you're going to end up killing the hostages as well as the terrorists. Fractions of a second are all that separates you from killing or being killed. In these fleeting moments, you have to make critical analysis of the situation and ensure that you're aiming at the right position and the right target. Video screens have now been introduced to the killing house, reconstructing different scenarios. A team member has a split second to make a decision on whether or not to shoot.
In our siege scenario, tensions are starting to rise within the camp. Shut up! This is when the negotiator's skills are put to the test. Hello, Tajik. How can I help? By now, the terrorists will be highly suspicious, knowing that an attack on them may be imminent. No, we know you are watching us. We know you are making plans. There is only one important place. The others we just killed. The negotiator must remain calm and helpful, projecting a neutral persona, avoiding confrontation, and trying to establish a positive rapport. The whole situation is very serious, and you have to understand in all in my power to, to try and resolve this peacefully, that's ultimately what I want. I just want a peaceful conclusion to this. Meanwhile, the situation is being constantly monitored by the command team. Sophisticated surveillance equipment will allow them to observe movements and conversations, whilst infrared and thermal imaging systems mean that the scene can be observed 24 hours a day. Snipers will have been in position for some time, gathering intelligence and constantly reporting every minute development. However, at any moment their role could change dramatically. The sniper has a myriad of responsibilities in a hostage scenario. As well as observing and relaying crucial intelligence, they will be covering the movement of all personnel and preventing terrorist escape attempts. During an assault, they will be constantly monitoring the team's progress and report any new hazards or terrorist activity. White, one eight to the balaclava on, identified, carrying along. When the time comes, they will be ready to dispense a precisely aimed shot wherever necessary. After being fully briefed about the incident, the sniper teams will be deployed around the target area. Each allocated a side of the building to cover, based on a colour labelling system. For our scenario, the area is split into four zones. White, green, black and red. White normally being the front of the target building. One lads. OK. Just move through the police cordon now, right? You're going to move into area red. Can you cut down this wall of this building here? And then cut through and I'll show you the position from down now, yeah? Okay? okay. Any probs? No, fine, fine. Okay. Okay, lads. Stronghold, she's down here to the right, right? So about, hold on, 50 metres away. Each sniper team will take it in turns on duty. Six hours on, six hours off. Snipers will wear the same black kit as the assault team when positioning in a built-up area, but can switch to a ghillie suit when hiding in deep foliage. OK, we're looking on to black, yeah? We've got a little view of uh, red as well, once a little block of red, yeah? So what we're going to do is we move forward an hour, maybe five, eight metres, try and pick up a position there, get down, He's trying to get a decent sight picture there. The sniper will have at least two rifles. One for daytime use, and one fitted with a night vision scope. They will have been through exactly the same training as every other member of the SAS, and may therefore be called upon to join the assault team if necessary. The sniper teams are coordinated from the operations centre, normally by a sniper commander who will be in contact with the teams via radio. It is his decision and orders that will initiate a sniper assault. That's air, this is a radio check, over. Roger, sniper one, come back. You have three in position on black, over. Right, let's have a look at the sniper team in a counter-terrorist situation. The spotter's role. He's looking through the binos. He's got a wider view of vision of the target area. He's also looking for any movement in the building. As soon as he sees that movement, he will notify his sniper. The sniper will then pick up his weapon, look through his telescopic sight, and try and pick up the X-rays or the enemy, in other words.